hi. We're Andrew and Mark from Beatcamp. Recently, we spoke to John Saunderson, who's the head of A&R at Notting Hill Music, one of the best independent publishers in the world. They've signed more top artists than we've had hot dinners, including Daft Punk, Calvin Harris, DJ Fresh, DJ SKT, and the new Kygo track, which is currently number one worldwide. We received loads of questions to ask John, so here are the three that we've picked. I would say let's go with the first question from our producer. We ask our community to ask you questions. Sure. And the first one is Emiliano Ornery is asking, uh, do you accept application for writing camps or are these only for the, the roster of your producer and writers? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a tricky one because we, we um, obviously we do this for our writers. So, for example, when we do the big tile yard one, which is really un extraordinarily big, um, what we tend to do is if it's 75 people, I'll have 25 writers from Notting Hill We'll have 25 writers from, uh, from Tile Yard, and then we'll try and um, find another 25 writers that are not necessarily signed to us. Mm -hmm. um, but if I do a writing camp in Norway, and they invite my writers to their camp, then I'll try and invite their writers to ours. So in the 25 that's left, we'll invite people from Japan, Korea, which we've done writing camps at, Norway, Denmark, Sweden. Uh, and, and we're always left with maybe five places that we can offer to other people so yeah if you see on social media that we're doing a writing camp absolutely send send an email or send get in touch with me via your social media and I'll, tr I'll try and get them on one of my faults i'm being told is that i give my time far too freely and i give my opportunities far too freely but the way i look at it is that unless I extend out to the, not just our people, but how am I going to find the next Robbie Williams? How am I going to find the next Dizzy Rascal if I don't give people a chance? Yeah, we go to the second question from yeah. our uh, producers. Uh, this is from uh, Malcolm Ramsey and he says, how often do you find new music you are passionate about but are unable to place it in a commercial setting? Um, it's, it's, it's not very often because I kind of know because I spend a lot of my time in offices with the majors and with the independents, I kind of know what they're looking for. So when I passionately, when I find something and I'm really passionate about it, um, I will make it work. And uh, Leo um, Whiteley, who's a sync guy and head of creative, we'll sit together on a project and we'll work out, okay, so we've just signed this thing. How are we going to make it work? Uh, and we'll sit there and he'll pass it out to um, lots of sync agencies and and, and, and direct to um, uh, music supervisors for films and stuff like that. I'll pass it, you know, I, as I say, I go to a lot of these conferences in Miami and Ibiza and Amsterdam and Cannes, which we just got back from last week. Um, so I know all the labels from abroad. So I can literally, they're, and they're not just acquaintances, they're actually friends. So I will send that product out to all our sub-publishers, all the labels I know, uh, and within two days we can literally change, we, we can literally get five or six deals in, which could mean you know, 20 grand, the, the, you know, the kid who gave me the project's going, oh my god, I didn't think this was going to happen so quickly. There are times when you send stuff out and it doesn't work, it doesn't connect. But I'd like to think that after 32 years in the industry, I kind of know what people are looking for. So it's not very often that I really passionately feel strongly about something and it doesn't work. It happens, but thankfully not very much. And I know that because I still have my job. <laughs> just, about, just about, just about. <laughs> so we have another question from our producers here and he's from Nick Murphy. They said you used to manage I inside did, the indeed. base sets. And so the question is, you recently attended LIPA in uh, Liverpool Music College. What do you think about it? Uh, it was probably one of the most satisfying things I've ever done, ever done in my um, musical career. Um, I went there expecting to be, you know, like half a dozen or, 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 or you know, or a dozen people there, and I walked into this theatre, uh, eight hundred seater theatre, which was really kind of scary, and a little desk in the middle of the, this massive stage, um, and all these students looking at me, look, saying, you know tell me how I can become an amazing writer, an amazing performer. Um, 
really, really scary. Uh, but I, you know, I, um, I'm used to talking to a lot of people. And um, I first started off by just saying, look, I'm not going to spat fingers at you. I'm not going to tell you how screwed the industry is because I know you're all 16, 70 year old kids who have nothing else in your mind but make music. So I'm just going to give you a snapshot of what I do on a day to day basis, how I can take writers in, nurture them, love them. Every one of my writers is like, they're like family, they're like kids. Um, to me, and I'm really passionate about that. But you know, I I just told them about all the things that I do: the songwriting camps, the co-writes, the pitching for syncs, the pitching for briefs, the um, uh, you know, get, getting you know music in films and, and stuff like that. Um, and it was a two-hour session, and I was absolutely worried that my speech would last 20 minutes. Um, and we critiqued some songs along the way. Um, you know, and I gave some, thankfully, some really good critique that they actually agreed with, thankfully. Um, so it was, it was a really, really fantastic day for me. Uh, so much so that they've asked me to go back and do one every other month now. Um, and it, I, I feel that I've done this for 32 years now. Um, and I think it's, you know, I love putting something back. And I don't get paid apart from the hotels and stuff. But I just want to... Uh, explain to people that you know this is a great industry it's not as lucrative as it once was it never will be again I really truly believe that but I don't think people get into this purely for making money I think people get into this industry because they love the music they love passionately love what they're doing so yeah it was a, it was a, it was an amazing day and I came I came away with something like 160 CDs um, and, and, and memory sticks and stuff, which took me about four weeks um, weekend work to get through. But every single person who gave me a stick got um, a reply. And that was the thing that really sort of, really showed me that, that they really um, uh, enjoyed what I did. And not only that, but they were so, so really relieved that I'd actually gone back to them and, and gave them a little bit of critique. Some of it they didn't like. Um, because you know some of it was not great as you can imagine out of 160 odd things um, but every one of them got a reply which they were really surprised about and I don't think there's enough A&R people in this industry that takes the time to actually go back and say you know what this was good but you need to work on the chorus you need to work on production um, and every single person that I sent an email back to came back to me saying I didn't think you would even you know come back to me so it was Probably the best thing I've ever done. Cool, thanks. Sorry, I get a bit. <laughs>